how are you all doing this beautiful, like, it's like misty morning. It's amazing. It's that, it's that time in California where it's like cold and misty and it fakes you out because you're like, oh, we're going to get fall weather. And then it's 5,000 degrees by one o'clock. And we're like, oh, you tricked me again, California, you minx. Ah, oh, California. But you know what? It's a beautiful place, and it's a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord. It is good to worship with you, whether you are here on campus or whether you are worshiping with us online. We want to say a hearty good morning to everybody. We are glad that you are here. We are continuing on in the book of James this morning as we are getting real. Uh, James doesn't pull any punches, and you know what? Neither do we. We're keeping it real up in here. And so this morning, we're going to have a great time of worship. We're going to have a time in the Word as Pastor Joe continues on through uh, this incredible book of, of the Bible. We, are, we are, are getting kind of, we're a little past the halfway point, and uh, you know what? It's, it's good stuff, man. We're going to wrap up with a time of worship and response at the end, and we've even got a new song for you this morning, a great new song we are really excited about. Band had a lot of fun putting that one together. All in all, we're going to be here about 55 minutes this morning, so we would just invite you to worship and to uh, praise as you are led. If you're a uh, raise your hands, dance around, do that. We would love to see that. If that's not your scene, if you're more just a kind of sit and sing and contemplate, totally fine to do that too. But if you're led, would you stand as we begin in our time of worship? Two.
your name. The mountains shake and crumble. At your name, the oceans roar and tumble. At your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry out. Lord, Shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. Out of your There is no name in heaven or on earth higher. There is none greater. There is no one, no one like our God. And so we could look for a thousand years. We could spend all of our time and energy trying to find something better, something more worthy of our time and our pursuit and our passion. But when all is said and done, and we stand before you, we will know, Lord, that there is nothing, nothing greater, nothing better. We will acknowledge with all of creation that there is no one like our God. There is no one like you. And so, Father, we thank you so much for your presence in this place. We thank you for your love. 
We thank you for your salvation. And we ask now, God, that you would go before us. Help us to continue in this attitude and this mindset of worship as we continue now to worship you in the word. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Woo! I love that song. Thank you for leading us in that worship, Jess. Beautiful reminder. There's nothing else we need to be shouting today than the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Actually, on the Jewish calendar, the opening of September every year, there's actually a day to do just that. It's called Yom Teruah, or Feast of Trumpets, big shouting day. And uh, I just love, I love that idea, and I think that's something for us to be mindful of as we move into our week. Amen? Name in Jesus. Let's shout that out. Good morning once again. I'm Jennifer Richmond. I'm one of the pastors here at La Mirada Church. I work mostly with the women and the kids, and every now and then I get to say hi to you lovely people in big church. And as we're in here, I'm praying that the little kids in little church are don't have our teachers strapped to any chairs or anything. You know, actually, we didn't, we didn't coordinate with Pastor Jess this morning on our message in the kids' church, but we are shouting the name of Jesus with the kids. Isn't that great? So when I walked in here getting ready for announcements and I heard that song, I'm like, that's so awesome, God. So when you pick up your kids, you're going to see them with little megaphones. We're literally shouting the name of Jesus. Isn't that great how God just brought that all together? God is good. Amen. We have a great worship service here for you today. We're going to continue on in preaching in just a minute. Um, but we also have great things coming up this week. So Tuesday is going to be our women's Bible study in the morning. We have men's Bible study in the evening. Wednesday, we have women's Bible study in the evening. And I think there's something else on campus Wednesday. I don't know. <laughs> We have youth group this Wednesday, and I've been told they are going to be burning things. Wait, no, bonfire. Okay, clarification. Bonfire. We have a lot of great things going on. Please, please do this. Check us out on social media, Facebook, Instagram. Stay in touch there. And then also we have a great website where you can always keep in touch there as well. And for now, I'm going to turn over the loop to you and let you watch the updates there. Jennifer here. More than ever before, I'm hearing from women who are longing for community and even more for hope and direction. I'd like to encourage you to connect in our women's Bible study. We meet this week, Tuesday, 9.30 a.m. or Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. It's a community study, so anyone from any church can attend. Pick up the lesson today at the welcome table, and we'll see you this week. here at La Mirada Church, and I'm so glad you guys are here with us this morning, and yes, we do have a lot of awesome stuff coming up, the Thanksgiving dinner, the youth group, men's, women's, join us, have fun with us, it is a great, great time. Um, if you've been here the last few weeks, or have ever read the book of James, and heard what he had to say, then you already know that James doesn't hold back. It's blunt, straight up, in your face, practicality. 
and it, and it has been the last few weeks, but today, this morning, my goodness, today we're going to need to put on our helmets, fasten our seatbelts, brace ourselves, and take any and all proactive measure, uh, protective measures because we're going to get hit really hard. Okay, James is not trying to make friends with the chapter today. <laughs> He's just telling you brutally what is honest and what is true. And so let's get right into it, James 4.1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? All right, this is a great question, which looked at from surface level provides very different answers, right? It all depends on who you're asking and who's fighting and what the situation is at hand. But if you dig deep, right, if you dig past the fight on who should win the election, if you dig past the argument on how COVID should be handled, if you dig deep past the debate on racial injustice and law enforcement, if you dig deep past any and all disagreements we have with anyone, from loved ones to, to enemies, about family, finances, religion, you have it. When you dig past the surface reason to any argument, you get to the heart of the issue behind every single fight and quarrel. And James tells us what that is in the second half of this verse. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? The source of fighting and arguing is always the same. To fulfill a desire inside of us. To take an internal longing and turn it into an outside reality. And James says we will do almost anything to make that longing into a reality. Next slide. You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. All right, James is blunt, but he's not that blunt, all right? <laughs> James isn't talking about literally killing people in order to achieve our desires. I believe he's referencing Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus equated hatred and unrighteous angers toward other with what? With murder, with killing, right? And I believe James is doing that here. Because, think about it, when other people don't share our desires, we don't like them. Go on Facebook for two seconds and you'll know exactly what I mean, right? We don't like them if they don't share our desires. And Okay, so we let that fester in our hearts long enough and not liking them turns into anger. And then anger eventually turns into hatred, especially when they get what they desire and we don't. And when that happens, jealousy comes into play which James conveniently talks about next. Next slide. You covet, but you cannot get what you want. So what do we do with that person? It turns into a 364 comment section on Facebook, right? Just back and forth that you're reading at 4 a.m. when you should be sleeping. We all know what you're talking about, right? <laughs> That's what happens. We quarrel and fight because we're jealous and because we're angry and because they don't share our desires. And now you're sitting there thinking, wow, Joe, what nasty behavior. Right? What nasty behavior? What kind of evil desires must one have in order to hate and harbor unrighteous anger and covet, which leads to these unpleasant four-in-the-morning arguments and quarrels on Facebook? And here's the deal with that. James is talking about all desires, even desires for good, righteous, and holy things. He's not just talking about evil desires here. He's talking about desires within us that are good and holy that we want to come to life. What James is saying here is this. You all have desires within you, some good and some bad, that you want to become a reality. But right now, at this moment, I, James, don't really care if they're good or bad. What I do care about and am bothered greatly by is the selfish spirit and bitterness of your fights and quarrels that you're having with every single person who doesn't share the same desires that you have. Good or bad, he doesn't care. He's saying, you all want something, and if it's good, that's great. But if you're fighting and you're bitter about it, then it's just as bad as the evil ones. Now, how do I know this? How do I know that James is speaking of selfish and bitter fighting over bad and good desires. How do we know he's talking about good desires here? Because next, he tells us to ask God in prayer for the good desires. Look at what it says. You do not have because you do not ask God. Here's the rhetorical question. Would James get up and say, hey everyone, those evil desires that you so badly want to come to life, you don't have them because you haven't been asking God for them. 
Is he going to say that? Is he going to ask us to pray for our evil desires to come to life? Have you met James? I mean, he hates sin, right? It doesn't make sense. No. What he's talking about here, the prayers he's talking about here, the desires that we want, he's talking about good desires that we want to come to life, but in the worst way possible. Through unrighteous anger and fighting, and all along, James is yelling here, the selfish and bitter fighting with others who don't agree with you is never going to make your desires come to fruition. It's not going to work. But you know what just might work? Prayer. How about we stop fighting for a second and pray about it? That's what James is talking about. He's saying we have not because we ask now you may be thinking, okay, Joe, that's actually not true because I ask for good desires of mine to come to life all the time, but here I am still waiting. Next slide. When you ask, you do not receive <laughs> because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Now, a huge rule of studying the Bible is context, 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 right? So in light of selfishly arguing with those whose desires do not line up with ours, what wrong motives leading to our pleasures is James talking about specifically here? I'm going to answer that question with another question. When we pray, and let's be honest, don't raise your hands, just think about it. When we pray, are we doing it almost vindictively? Do our prayers and attitudes focus on our righteous desires coming to life, not so much for the benefit of the kingdom of heaven, but to prove to those that disagree with us that our desires are God's will and theirs aren't. Do our prayers and attitudes, our response to them, to our prayers and attitudes, if our response to our righteous desires coming to life would ever lead us to say, I told you so, before genuinely saying, thank God his will is being done then we aren't going to get what we want. It's just not going to happen. If the first thing we say when our prayer is answered is, I told you so, instead of thank God his will is being done, we're never going to get what we want. This is exactly what James is talking about here. You see, those kinds of prayers and living that kind of attitude not only is not going to get us what we want, we are actually siding with the world in that sense. And it's, and, and, and it's selfishness instead of siding with God. When we do this, when we just use God, we're siding with the world because that is something the world would do. And James tells us that in blunt fashion next, what he does best. Next slide. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity, which is hostility, against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. When we're only praying to God in an effort to bring about our desires for the sake of winning a fight and proving others wrong, we are committing spiritual adultery because we're abusing our relationship with him. In doing so, we're just using God, which is exactly what the world would do, which means we're siding with the world and consequently become an enemy of the Lord. And when we become an enemy of God, he gets very, very jealous. Next slide. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? Now, when we read this, we must understand God's not all insecurely jealous up there in heaven saying, oh, no. Joe chose the world over me. How could I ever possibly go on? I guess I'll just grab a pint of Ben and Jerry's, throw on my PJs, and play all by myself on the record player. No. No, this is not an insecure jealousy that is afraid that we're going to find someone else or something better, and that's because there isn't anyone else or anyone better. There isn't. The jealousy of God is a secure jealousy that passionately seeks out what is best for us. God loves us, 
and he jealously wants what's best for us and our lives. That is why he intensely calls us out for siding with the world by bitterly arguing for our desires to come to life instead of choosing to side with him by genuinely presenting our desires to him through prayer. Because in that prayer, we can find the help we need with our attitudes toward those who disagree with us. In that prayer, we can find the discipline we need to stop fighting. And in that prayer, we can find the direction we need regarding the action God wants us to take to bring about our desires according to his perfect will. He wants us to pray, yes, for his glory, but also for our extreme benefit. Guys, God is jealous for our well-being. Not of it, for it. And so he wants us praying instead of arguing. Because if what we desire is truly his will and we want to see his kingdom advance, he will grant it. But as jealous as God is, he is even more full of grace. Even when we find ourselves siding with the world and so desperately wanting to come back near him. Next slide. <laughs> but he gives us more grace. James stops yelling at us for a second and tells us something nice here, right? But he gives us more grace. And how do we have access to this grace? The rest of verse 6 tells us on the next slide. But he gives us more grace. This is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. New Testament, written in what language in, uh, originally? Greek. Greek, exactly. In Greek, grace and favor, both highlighted there, are the exact same word. All right, And its definition is the unmerited favor of God. And verse 6 says here that unmerited favor is shown to the humble, but not the proud. Why? And that's because grace and pride are complete opposite eternal enemies. All right? Couldn't be further apart. And pride demands, pride demands that God bless us strictly in light of our human merits, what we have accomplished. And in God's righteous eyes, what can we humans accomplish on our own? Anything that would impress him? No. But grace, thank God, grace will not deal with us on the basis of anything in us good or bad, but only on the basis of God because it's his favor to give. And true humility puts us in the position to receive that gift. And so how do we show humility? James is very glad you asked. Next slide. Here you go. Submit yourselves then to God. That word then means what I just said. Here's your answer. You want grace? Submit yourselves to God. Submitting to God means to side with God. And to side with God means to stop siding with the world. Which, specifically here in James 4, means to stop fighting and quarreling with those whose desires do not line up with ours. And instead, go to God with them and ask him to bring those desires to fruition according to his will. And when we do that, we'll find ourselves resisting the world and treating those different than us, a lot better than we have before. Which is exactly what the devil does not want us to do. And the next verse tells us why. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resist the world, resist the devil, and he'll have to do what he does not want to do, which is leave us alone. <laughs> All right? He will flee. New Testament written in what language originally? Again, Greek. That word resist in Greek is a military term, and its definition is to establish one's position publicly by conspicuously holding one's ground. I'm going to read that again. To establish one's position publicly by conspicuously holding one's ground. In other words, resisting the devil isn't just something we believe in our hearts or something we think is true or is a good idea. It is a public, conspicuous, physical action that the devil can actually see. And believe me when I say, that's very, very important. 
The summer between my sophomore and junior year of high school, I got up early five mornings a week and took a three-mile run. I know, hard to believe these days, but back then I did it. <laughs> All right? Five mornings a week, three-mile run. Now, I had to do it. I didn't want to. I had to do it because I, I needed to stay in shape for varsity baseball tryouts that fall. But gosh, I, I hated running. I, I hated running. I always have. I always will. I've never had the greatest endurance, even back then. And I lived in Moreno Valley. And Moreno Valley in the summer, it got so hot. I, even though I got up early, it was already 90 degrees by the time I started running. And so uh, as difficult as running already was, as difficult as it already was, I encountered something daily towards the end of my run, making my run even more difficult and annoying than it already was. On the last stretch of the run, completely out of breath, sore everywhere, sweating to death because it's already past 90 degrees, when I am just hating running so much, right at the end, I run past this house every time, every day, with a very long front yard. And this very long front yard was lined with a fence. And as I trudged along, barely alive, along the length of this fence, Every single day, what followed me was this chihuahua, just. <laughs> this bug-eyed, overgrown hamster with a tail <laughs> would just run along the length of the fence with me and just wouldn't stop. I mean, I can't call it barking. Like, yep, 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 yep. Yep, 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 yep. And every time it yipped, it had to bounce because its bark was literally bigger than its body. Yep, 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 yep. Just bouncing, bug eyed, chasing me down the fence. And by the time I finally got to the end of this yard, I looked back to see him puff up his chest, like, yeah, you better run. Like, you can just tell he's so proud that he scared off the scary guys. And guys, it was annoying. So very annoying. I'm out of breath. I am sore in places I didn't know existed. I am sweating. And day by day by day, this barking bedroom slipper would just not leave me alone. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. And would be so proud when I'd pass. Eyes out to here. Like, just leave me alone, dude. I knew it was annoying. And I knew this drove me crazy. But I never did anything. I didn't actually resist. I didn't do anything about how I felt for almost the entire summer. But one day, with about two weeks of summer left, and it's August, so it's even hotter than usual out, I said, I've had enough. So I'm running past this house with the same yapping from the same gerbil on steroids. But this time, by the time I got to the end of the yard, I stopped mid-step. I pull a 180, I face the dog, and I go, ah! <laughs> And it was like a dramatic movie car accident. The dog flipped back so many times. <laughs> Just kept flipping over and over and over until he finally stopped, like the car finally stopped in the car accident in the movie. And then he gets up and he yips all the way to the front porch and hides there. And then for the rest of the summer, when I'd run by, he would see me, put his tail between his legs, and run to the porch, and then just kind of stare at me. <laughs> Bug eyes, like this. And I would stare at him in return, like, what up now? What's up, dude? What's up? What's up? What's up? <laughs> kind of like a begrudging street gang respect toward the other, you know? What's up? What's up? What's up? As I keep running. All summer, I was so annoyed with that dog, if I can call it that. But just believing it to be annoying didn't stop him from being annoying. It needed to see that I'd had enough before he finally stopped yapping. Why? Because this dog couldn't read my mind. It needed to see with action that I'd had enough. I needed to resist physically, and the same goes with the devil. You know that God can read our minds and our hearts, but you know who can't? The devil. He can't read our minds. He can't read our hearts. 
just believing him to be annoying, just knowing he's wrong, just hoping he'll stop and leave us alone, will not stop him because he cannot read our minds or our hearts. He can only see actions. Which is why James uses the word resist here. We've got to establish our position publicly by conspicuously holding our ground and physically resisting the devil, showing him that we've had enough of his causing so many in this world to turn against each other because Satan would like nothing more than to divide us so that we'd fight amongst ourselves and have no energy left to fight the real battle that's going on. So we must fervently resist the devil. We must fervently resist the devil, which will cause him to flee. And then, as James 4, 8 says, we must come near to God, and he will come near to us. And when we humbly do so, he'll provide us his ever-abounding, never-ending grace, forgiving us of our fights and our quarrels and our sins. And in return, we'll have the incredible opportunity to take that grace and show it to others. And in doing so, we give them their best chance to draw near to God, which will then bring some much-needed positive change to this world during such a tumultuous and dark time. We can change this world. We just got to do what James says. We got to stop fighting and bickering and arguing and take our requests and our desires to God. And if we truly want to see his kingdom come on earth and those desires match with that, they'll come true. Speaking of that ever-abounding, never-ending grace that he will show us when we draw near to him, Jesus showed us the ultimate example of that through his sacrifice on the cross for our sins. And this morning, in a little bit, we're going to have a chance to remember and reflect on that sacrifice through the partaking of communion, with the bread representing his body broken and the juice representing his blood shed. So when the worship starts, as you feel led, please make your way to either communion table in the back, where you can grab a free packaged communion bread and juice and take it back to your seat to partake. And as a reminder, when you head to grab communion, you can also drop off your tithes and offerings located near those tables. And if you have any questions about what it means to be a Christ follower, about baptism, or anchoring down here at La Mirada Church and making it your church home, please come see me after the service right outside at the welcome table. I'd love to talk to you about that stuff. But right now, at this moment, would you pray with me as we bless this time of communion and worship? Dear Father, thank you for coming to earth, living a perfect life, dying on the cross for our sins, and raising from the grave. Help us, Father, to not argue with people who we don't agree with over our desires, and instead, humbly draw near to you, accepting your never-ending grace and forgiveness, and then presenting to you those desires through prayer asking for your will to be done in the process. May we in turn treat others we disagree with the way you treat us. Because in doing so, we then give them their best chance to draw near to God also. Bless this time of communion and worship. May it bring you glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
We're going to learn a new song together this morning, and I love, love, love the lyrics to this song. As we've been talking about kind of just having ugly hearts sometimes as people of faith, you know, I'm reminded that the bride of Christ is not always beautiful. And I think a lot of times that ugly comes from this idea that we are almost afraid that God's not going to come through. That he's not going to do for us what he said he's going to do. Uh, that he needs to be maybe, I don't know, defended. But you know what? God has never, ever, ever lost a battle, and he never will. And so this morning, we're going to learn this new song. I hope you love it as much as our team loves it. We're having a great time with it. Um, and if you would stand as we learn on the song, it's pretty easy. I think you'll pick it up real quick. Uh, but here we go. Miracles when you move. Here we go. What?
have a wonderful week. We'll see you next Sunday.